Okay, here we go with a respiratory emergencies lecture for the uh, advanced EMT, which is part of our uh, paramedic curriculum. So we hit respiratory emergencies here, um, probably in the sixth week of an advanced EMT course. And then uh, we talk a little bit more about it during the cardiology module, which is the next module. Um, and then again in medical emergencies one, and medical emergencies too, we hit respiratory emergencies for the pediatrics. And finally, in trauma, we're going to hit the uh, um, chest trauma kind of stuff that also gives you respiratory emergencies. So we'll revisit a lot of this as we go on. Uh, the first thing here is the primary assessment. And uh, as we're doing our scene survey and, you know, as we on our PPE and do the normal scene survey. Here, when we're taking care of a respiratory patient, what we'll want to do is make sure that um, we're looking for the clues from the environment, like what can we see that may give us an idea of why this person would be short of breath. If we're going into an industrial area, that might be um, keeping our situational awareness for um, maybe some hazardous materials. Uh, a certain smell or something like that. Otherwise, we're uh, looking for maybe evidence that there was an altercation, so even if this might be trauma. Uh, look to see if there's uh, signs of illicit drugs. It may be that they're on uh, methamphetamine or something like that. And then uh, we might also see something as simple as uh, nebulizers wait, uh, sitting around. Also try and uh, gather medications. That might be right there as a scene survey uh, item. As we approach our patient, we'll be doing our general impression, kind of looking at the position of the patient. Um, do they still seem to be able to sit up straight? Do we have that gestalt impression of whether they're sick or not sick? Another way to say that is maybe stable or not stable. What is their anxiety level? We can usually see their work of breathing pretty easy. And their LOC, are they talking to the people around them, like the firefighters who might be first responders? And then we're going to do what I would call a passive ABCs for most of our uh, shortness of breath patients who will be awake and looking at us. And so when we start our conversation with them, we'll be thinking, how is their airway? Do I hear any sounds? Uh, and how is their breathing? What kind of rate and uh, tidal volume am I dealing with? And circulation, we'd be able to pick up with just the color of the patient. And then so when we're talking about taking care of respiratory patients. Um, this is going to be true for almost all of our medical patients. The way we figure things out is doing a really good uh, patient history. So we'll start out by introducing ourselves and talking to talking with the patient about the reason that uh, 911 was summoned or why there is an ambulance there. And uh, again, one of my favorite questions uh, early on uh, maybe two good questions is, you know, what is your complaint? What is the problem? Why are, why did we call 911 today? And then uh, early on, you can say something like, tell me more about that. All right. Tell me more about that initial complaint. And another one uh, early on to start the conversation is what do you think it is? What do you think it is? Is a really good question right from the beginning, an easy one to remember. Um, and, uh, and, and it can get you a lot of information. It'll get you going down the right road right away. And then we're going to um, kind of prioritize sample and uh, OPQRST. And one we get from uh, the JB Learning EMT textbook is tacos. So sample, I'm not going to go over too much, but that is kind of a, you want to hit that as kind of, kind of a priority and it may be helping you get to uh, get to exactly what's going on when they have a history of asthma or COPD and things of that sort. When we OPQRST, um, we may have talked about that already with chest pain patients. That, that seemed to work really well for all pains. Uh, it doesn't really work with that great with uh, someone who's short of breath. Some good letters there is O for onset. What were you doing when it started? P is palliate or provoke. So um, what makes it better and what makes it worse? That can help. You know, does sitting up help? Does standing help? Does some certain position seem to help? And what makes it worse? 
quality doesn't really make sense and the region and radiation that doesn't really make sense either severity i don't think we should be putting this on a scale from one to ten but you could ask someone who has a history of asthma is how bad is this attack compared to others and then time is when did this start and has this been constant or getting worse tacos is something that i like to um like to use it is one of those things where sometimes the questions are irrelevant or not appropriate to ask but if you're running out of things to ask um, again you can fall back to tell me more about that um, and the tacos thing is tobacco how do you smoke do you use tobacco products a is alcohol c is caffeine o is other drugs or over the counters and then s could be um, like in the uh, JB learning they call it the sex drugs and that would be you know that I think that would be really good for people people with chest pain and you're asking them about the ED drugs but here S could be street drugs and then you can see if they um, possibly are taking things like cocaine or marijuana things of that sort so that gives you a better idea of what's going on around them some other good things to ask would be things like a surgical history and family history we need to pick up that um, pulmonary emboli which is a big risk factor thing so we might want to just talk to them about how were you yesterday um, how were things before that when were you last just symptom free everything was was fine so another great one early on um, if they if they had a good answer to what do you think it is you should say like what have you done already like uh, what 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 have you done to try and fix this before calling 911 and so as you're doing that assessment hopefully you have a partner there helping you with vital signs then you want to start a little bit of a, um, a, a physical exam and so here we're probably going to start with lung sounds and pulse oximetry so when we're uh, checking lung sounds uh, we're going to spend some time in there for me it's uh, quite a bit of time that we'll be spending uh, listening to each of the different areas of the chest hopefully posterior and anterior we want to look at the hands and feet looking for edema um, ask them some questions see how their level of consciousness is doing how their memory is and things of that sort looking for just uh, signs of hypoxia again when you're looking for work of breathing you might be looking at this time for the uh, accessory muscle use and retractions um, be looking for trauma and the idea that they might be doing some drugs you might be looking for tracks and things of that sort and entitled CO2 is something that I really like to use. I don't know how often in the shortness of breath patient that it gives you a lot of data, but uh, every once in a while it will give you a, a good bit of data, uh, you know, when they're way out of their range or, you know, when you're not that sold on their bronchoconstriction, but then you see those nice sharp fins when you put them on capnography. So here's a little bit more about lung sounds. Um, we're going to as paramedics talk more about vesicular bronchial and adventitious lung sounds this is something that as paramedic students we we need to know um, really as and, and when we're also thinking of it as national registry uh, candidates these are things that could easily be questions on the national registry and that stuff that we should be prepared for um, when we're out working as paramedics we don't usually use these terms to describe um, patients lung sounds at all these are normal lung sounds that's to begin with normal lung sounds we should also understand what the full respiratory cycle should sound like all right the way to do that is listening to lots of lung sounds as we're a student and what I advocate for for the first year when you're working as a paramedic listen to everyone's lung sounds that way you have a very good base of what normal is and then the abnormal stands out a little bit better and we're not going to go over this too much but we should know what rails and ronchi strider and wheezing are snoring um, if you're listening to this via a uh, youtube um, what i would suggest is uh, putting those terms into uh, the youtube search bar and there's going to be people out there that have all those um sounds available that you would be able to listen to the uh, place to listen to lung sounds here would be i like you to start on the back first i like that uh, i like to do that early 
while we're still taking care of the patient, hopefully in their home, because it's usually easier to um, assess their, their posterior than um, putting their steth putting your stethoscope on their skin is important. Seeing if you can look at that, that would be good to look for trauma, maybe signs of abuse. And then um, this is really easy to listen to their back. Patients may be used to this because their doctor often listens to their back. Um, the best place to listen for lung sounds is their back. A lot of students and stuff, right? You're, you're, you're familiar with nurses and doctors maybe listening to the front of your chest. Usually that is your doctor listening to your heart, all right? When your doctor listens to your back, that is where you're um, going to listen to lung sounds the best. However, when you're in the ambulance, it is more difficult to listen to the back. So I also advocate for listening to the front also. Just in way of therapeutic communication or setting the uh, relationship with your with your patient, it's much less intrusive for you to start by listening to their back. Patients don't mind that as much as listening to their front. Um, here is those different terms that we saw on that previous slide, things like tracheal lung sounds and bronchial lung sounds. For a tracheal lung sound, you'd be putting your stethoscope on the trachea. All right, a good place to do that would be the lower part of the neck. Your um, inspiratory and expiratory sounds should be equal. That's why we have that, um, that certain picture uh, right here when we look at this here. Um, that is kind of showing you the equalness of the um, inspiratory and expiratory. And both of them are loud. That accounts for that thickened line there as compared to the other lines that we see below. When we're checking bronchial sounds here, the bronchial sounds should be just off the sternum, all right, just off the sternum where the bronchi are. And those inspiratory sounds are shorter than the expiratory sounds, and both are loud. Um, uh, the reason for that is when we're listening for sounds, we're listening for air moving, let's go, let's call it air moving down a hallway, all right? Um, when that air is moving down a, a hallway at a slower rate, um, it's not going to give you a lot of sound, all right? When, these, when you're listening to those big bronchi, they don't give you a lot of sound there at the very beginning of inspiration. When we have bronchiovesicular, we're in, in the mid-chest, where vesicular, you're going to be listening to like in their armpits, all right? Way down low and in their armpits. Um, low in the in the chest cavity so that's vesicular so bronchial vesicular will be in between bronchial and vesicular then so mid chest these inspiratory and expiratory sounds will be equal again um, and they'll be uh, they'll be quieter than what we heard in the bronchial and the tracheal would have been the loudest the vesicular way out in the periphery then is the inspiratory sounds last longer now we can hear these as they're um, as they're going through those smaller passageways. Air moving through the smaller passageways is something that we can hear. Um, and then we hear them going on expiration too, but then we start to drift off at the end of expiration. We don't hear those sounds simply because they're not making sounds because there's so little air movement through those small passageways. So uh, those terms, again, are terms that you come across where there is maybe you're uh, reading something online or maybe even in your book and they'll say the bronchial sounds sound like this um, and the, like sometimes you'll hear something like your bronchial sounds are quieter than normal um, that's where you uh, hear and see or come across these terms um, it isn't like when we're explaining lung sounds to a nurse or a doctor and then uh, let's just talk about overall management for our patients who are complaining of shortness of breath. Early on, we kind of want to help them sit up and make sure that they're comfortable. Um, sometimes when we're talking about nursing home patients and such that may be used to laying in a bed and, um, and have somewhat of a semi-fowler's position, helping them uh, get into that high fowler's position may help uh, quite a bit. When we're talking about a patient who is really hypoxic, um, now we might be putting them on the stretcher a little earlier and getting them strapped in and making sure that they're safe and we're able to keep them in an upright position. Very often when we're dealing with respiratory patients, um, if we think about the way that we as EMTs and paramedics are, are taught how to manage someone's airway, 
we are almost always taught um, using mannequins that sit on a table, right? That's the very beginning way that we put in OPAs and NPAs and the supraglottic airways and intubation. They all start with and continue to be patients who are sitting on a, you know, just a head on a table. And then when we're doing them on the floor, it's usually still a mannequin who's on the floor. And we get a lot of experience taking care of people. I should say taking care of people's airway while they're supine. We should not think that's the best way, all right? The best way for us to uh, assist someone's ventilations is to have them in a semi-fowler's or even fowler's position. We can, um, we can use a BVM in that position. We can get them in a semi-fowler's position and drop a supraglottic airway and maybe even intubate in that position. Uh, um, it depends on, on where we are and how well we can uh, get our visual on the, on the glottic opening if we're talking about intubation. But don't feel that the patient always has to be uh, supine just because we kind of train that way a lot. We should be training and um, here we will training on ventilating a patient um, in the semi-fowler's position and maybe dropping some supraglottic airways that way too. If the patient is using their accessory muscles, they use them better when they're sitting up. So we're going to start IVs on pretty much everyone who has um, shortness of breath. Everybody gets an IV and uh, sometimes that'll be on the way to the hospital. Uh, most of the time it's pre-hospital. And then uh, we'll be giving nebulizers for people who have bronchoconstriction and CPAP for people who we believe um, need a little bit more pressure in their airway or we can uh, push some of that fluid back into the vessels. So while we begin management, and I think this is an important part, remember we talked about history and then the secondary and then or the physical exam and then we started talking about management. And then uh, by design here, after we begin taking care of a patient, that would mean that we have a good clinical impression. We, we feel like we know what's going on. Uh, we start our, our treatment and then we're going to do our differential diagnosis. So we would say to ourselves, what, what causes shortness of breath? And then uh, from there, we'd be able to form a good, um, differential diagnosis. So when we're taking care of that asthma patient, we will start ruling other things out. Even though like we know it's asthma, it's an asthma patient who, who's uh, you know, used their nebulizer all the way to the end today. They've had asthma attacks that were similar in the past. Everything points to asthma. Well, we'll start treating them for asthma then, but then we will start doing a differential diagnosis to make sure it's just asthma because we know things like Someone who has asthma could also have trauma to the chest. They could also have pneumonia. They could also be having a heart problem that's giving them pulmonary, uh, pulmonary edema. So um, what, do you, what kind of questions do you think we should be talking about? What kind of questions? Um, for me, then, I would say that the questions, let's say we're taking care of an asthma patient. Um, after we start treating the patient for asthma, we should be asking them questions like, have you had any, um, what we can start with is, do you think you have any risk factors for pulmonary emboli? And most patients are just going to look at you like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then just go down a bank of questions for a pulmonary emboli. Ask them if they've had recent surgery or broken bones. Have they had any long travel where they were stayed in the car or on, a, on an airplane for a long uh, period of time? Maybe rule out the idea that they had calf pain yesterday. See if they have some problem with hypercoagulability. All right, that might be assessing their medications too. Um, is it possible they have pneumonia? And again, you can just say that to the patient. Is it possible that you have a pneumonia or a pulmonary infection? And they may look at you dumb. Sometimes it's not an appropriate question to ask because you know that they're just going to not understand what you're talking about. So then you go for further and you say, do you, uh, have you had a fever, flu-like symptoms? Uh, have you been having a productive cough? And then can you tell me more about that productive cough? You can rule out trauma to the chest just by saying, have you had any trauma lately? Sometimes people don't understand that word. So you can follow that up with, how about any falls or fights, maybe car accidents? And then when they say no, no, and no, you're going to be more assured, you know, internally that boom, this is asthma. That's all we're dealing with. 
Other good questions might be, um, have you been working out lately? Is it a new workout? Um, have you been lifting boxes or doing anything? And then maybe lastly is, do you have any problems with anxiety? All right, have you ever had an anxiety problem that caused you to hyperventilate? All those are great questions to ask. Um, and you should be asking them in a way that this, the patient understands what you're doing is ruling things out. Um, the doctors are going to do this. You shouldn't think, well, nobody's ever going to ask them questions. Um, these questions do get asked, um, and it doesn't, doesn't take a doctor to do it. We can ask them early, um, and it helps us rule in the idea that they have asthma. And so what is asthma? Asthma, we know it here as the three S's, and the three S's are going to be secretions, spasms, and swelling. Secretions, spasms, and swelling. And everybody has a pretty good idea of what asthma is. As advanced EMTs, we have um, albuterol available to us. So we're going to give them albuterol, 2.5 milligrams and 3 cc's nebulized. We can give that to them um, early on pretty uh, benign medication. One thing that we want to do before we give that is we want to make sure this isn't someone who has a bunch of cardiac risk factors. So what I advocate for, um, and I don't like to give exacts on this, but whenever you as a paramedic student or advanced EMT, um, whenever you're going to give drugs, try to have, I like to say, three things. Every time you're going to give this drug, have three things that you always do. I should say always ask. And so sometimes that would be, um, uh, it would just be say convert, confirm bronchioles are, uh, um, are spasming. All right. So confirm wheezes. That might be one thing. So that's not a question. That's just one of those things in your head. Confirm. This is why I'm giving it. All right. I'm giving it for this. Um, a good question to ask here are, do you have any cardiac history? And do you have any chest pain? Um, so do you have cardiac history? Do you have chest pain? And then uh, some asthma patients do have chest pain, of course, but then have them describe that further and start to um, really work on ruling out the idea that this is an MI. So later on as paramedics, we can put them on a heart monitor, maybe even do a 12 lead. Um, but we, uh, any uh, adrenergic drug and Albuterol is an adrenergic drug. Any of those that we, we're going to come across, um, all of those are contraindicated if the person is having an MI. Uh, so we really want to be careful if we're thinking of the patient as a cardiac problem. So uh, three things that I like to go with for um, the nebulizers, uh, or maybe beta-2 nebulizers specifically, is um, think to yourself, this is for uh, bronchiospasms. All right. I'm going to, I want to relax the bronchioles. Two would be, uh, is this cardiac in nature or is this a uh, chest pain sound like it could be cardiac? And the last one is realize that this is going to increase your heart rate. And so then the next thing that I'm thinking about is, do I think this is going to increase this person's heart rate into a danger zone? Or do I actually think that after I give him albuterol, his pulse rate isn't going to go up. It's probably going to go down because they're going to be breathing easier. And I think that's about it for asthma. So bronchiolitis, uh, bronchitis is next. So chronic bronchitis, one of the COPDs. Uh, we know that this is from uh, smoking probably over years and years, probably smoking a bunch over years and years. Um, the way the chronic bronchitis patient fights the disease is they increase the mucus production in their bronchioles, all right? The way they do that is they increase the number of goblet cells. Um, kind of interesting part of your pathophysiology chapter here. There is actually then, if, if we read about it, uh, you'll see um, early on, very often, even in EMT textbooks, it will say that the chronic bronchitis patient has an increased number of goblet cells and those goblet cells produce mucus, so they have an increased amount of mucus in that lining of the bronchioles, which ends up clogging their airway. So if we're increasing the amount of goblet cells, what's, what we're doing is changing um, what, what tissue uh, was there. Instead of it being simple epithelial with cilia, now we have some, we'll just go with the goblet cells. When we're changing tissue like that, 
that's a risk factor for cancer. So boom, there you go with that. Uh, uh, smoking being a risk factor for lung cancer. If this is the way that your lungs are fighting the disease, it completely should make sense. So when that person has this increased mucus, it's going to clog up the airways. Easy to see in those pictures there. When we clog up an airway, um, meaning then that oxygen is not going to be going down to the alveoli, and CO2 is going to kind of uh, build up there in the alveoli, maybe. Um, when that happens here in the pulmonary circulation, the blood vessels in that area will constrict. All right. Um, so we have problems in our pulmonary circulation. Whenever this happens, think about this. All right. Whenever we have a problem with an alveoli or with some of the tissue in the lung is just not working. You know, the working tissue like alveoli isn't working. We will have vasoconstriction in that area. All right. Whenever we have vasoconstriction, we have shunting. All right. We had that in the body. We, we vasoconstrict with and we have uh, adrenaline as we're fighting shock, as we talked about. So we also immediately, even as EMTs, we say vasoconstriction. That's where they get that pale and cool, clammy skin. So vasoconstriction equals pulmon or equals shunting. So here we have pulmonary vessel constriction, so we get pulmonary shunting. Whenever you hear the term pulmonary shunting, the next thing that you should throw in your, uh, you know, the next thing that goes along with that is pulmonary hypertension. All right, and then follow this sequelae. Pulmonary hypertension is going to equal right heart failure. All right, so when the uh, when the heart signed the contract, um, the left side signs a contract that says I get all the muscle all right that's where most of your most of your heart is the muscle of the left ventricle the left side of your heart is built to pump against pump against pressure but the right side of your heart is not built to pump against pressure all right so its contract basically says it doesn't have to pump against pressure when you have a pulmonary problem that causes there to be a poor diffusion there, you're going to get vessel constriction. That's going to give you pulmonary shunting. That's going to give you pulmonary hypertension. And the next thing that is, you know, predictable is right heart failure. When we talk about that, um, you know, those sequence of events, that is core pulmonale. Core pulmonale, uh, Latin, heart and pulmonale. It's a heart problem from respiratory issues. All right, and then we learned this hopefully before, and that person is a blue bloater. He's a blue bloater because he fights the disease um, kind of with uh, with building up mucus in his lungs, which doesn't allow for good oxygenation. That's why he gets blue. And then he's a bloater because I like to call it two different reasons. Uh, first one is one that I kind of just explained, but we only talked about it as right heart failure. You should early on put it in your head, right heart failure equals JVD and peripheral edema. That's part of the bloater, JVD, peripheral edema. Some other things that we'll throw in there is ascites, that's water in your abdomen. And then uh, every once in a while we'll talk about that backing up in the liver a bit and the hepatojugular reflux. So uh, that's one way that they're a blue bloater. The other one is this person often has a sedentary lifestyle. So if you think about it, if you go to work, you work in a five-story office building and you run the stairs usually because you like to stay fit. If uh, you're in these early stages of chronic bronchitis, um, when you're doing that, you're going to end up stressing your heart out more. You're going to end up with chest pain um, and you're going to stop taking the stairs. You're going to take the elevator instead. Instead of playing ball in the park, you're going to maybe buy a video game. So and that's going to lead to worse and worse um, uh, habits, I guess you would say. And that sedentary lifestyle is going to end up causing you to be a little chubbier than you want to be. So blue bloater, whenever you Google pictures of chronic bronchitis, they usually have a blue bloater there for your images. So the other COPD, usually we get asthma, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema all as the COPDs. Most people kind of throw asthma out, all right? It is chronic, it is obstructive, um, but it's very different from emphysema and chronic bronchitis.
these two COPDs are generally caused by smoking. Um, they also seem associated with things like uh, working in an area like a the coal mines or someplace where you had small uh, particles that were able to get into your lungs. The emphysemic fights the disease with their lungs. All right. So usually when we're talking about emphysema, we talk about, um, you know, the big things for the pathophysiology are this uh, damaged and enlarged alveoli. You can see a picture there. Um, the other thing that is often associated, like in your textbook, it'll usually say damaged and enlarged alveoli. Then it'll say loss of elasticity in the lung tissue there. And then the last one is an increased tidal volume. So here again, the, the patient's going to be fighting the disease with their lungs, but maybe fighting it a little better than that mucus because here the oxygen is still going to get to the alveoli at least. Those alveoli might be less uh, less capable, but they're still uh, getting some oxygen down there and they're still able to um, get rid of some CO2. But this increased the um, dead air space inside the lungs. When you destroy your um, alveoli like that, uh, you're going to have an increased dead air space. So here comes some numbers then. We remember that our tidal volume was 500, right? So if our um, tidal volume is 500, the, uh, um, the, the, what was that called? The, the, the dead air space was 150, all right? And that gave us um, a usable air of um, 350. That's what our normal is. All right. So if our tidal volume is 500 here, uh, 150 of that is just ends up in the trachea and the bronchus where we um, where we don't have any uh, diffusion happening. So when we uh, put these together, uh, when we subtract 150, the dead airspace from the 500, which is the normal tidal volume for that 175 pound college age male, we would end up something, we would end up with something like that. All right. So this person fights this disease. They have an increased um, dead airspace. So instead of having 150 there, they are going to have um, 250, let's say. All right. So they have 250 of dead airspace. And again, that would be over time. So the way they fight the disease is they get a tidal volume of 600, all right? And so this math still works. They increase their tidal volume. How do we see that? We see that with a barreled chest, all right? This barreled chest there, that second one down here, um, this uh, means the AP um, distance, the anterior posterior distance is bigger. Um, and instead of the uh, chest being um, like 19 inches wide and 10 inches uh, going from anterior posterior, now the anterior posterior is way bigger. All right, so it's more of a barrel. So looking down at a barrel, that's why they call it a barreled chest. Because when we look down at it, it's now uh, round instead of an oval. So uh, we see here they also exhale through pursed lips. And I, re I like to um, refer to that for two different reasons, all right? The thing is, you don't see them. You almost always see this explained as the second reason I'm going to give here. So we already talked about we breathe in a tidal volume of 500. And uh, when we're uh, talking about inspiratory, 500, that was using muscles, when we breathe off, 500 or when we're exhaling, um, we easily breathe off 500, right? We easily breathe in 500. We easily breathe off 500 active on the inspiratory and passive, not using muscles on the expiratory. But then when we go to uh, 600 on the inspiratory, we increase the amount of muscle that we had to do that. Um, well, now when we breathe off, we passively breathe off 500, but then at the end, we need to actively breathe off 100 more. So then you see the patient breathe in, deeper, breathe off, and then at the end, he has to push a little bit more. 
and uh, and that is one of the reasons that you may be able to see that more activity at the end of expiration. And that pursed lip breathing, what will be in your book is when you breathe through pursed lips, you give yourself a little bit of peep, a little bit of positive and expiratory pressure. So those are two good reasons for pursed lip breathing. And so uh, there's usually tightness in the chest and the patient may be fatigued. And another thing that is uh, tied to emphysema is polycythemia. We'll talk more about that um, later on in paramedic class, but we need to know that that's the opposite of anemia. Polycythemia is a simple increase in red blood cells. All right, it's like blood doping. All right, the patient um, just gives themselves more red blood cells. And hence, we have a pink puffer. They puff because of those pursed lips, and they're pink because um, they have increased red blood cells. So um, they're also getting oxygen in and out. So better than the blue bloater, they are getting oxygen in and out. So they get to have, hopefully, pink skin while they puff away. Acute pulmonary edema is next, and that's going to be fluid in the lungs. And when we're talking about that fluid, we right now we kind of have to make that distinction between mucus which seems like a fluid right but it's mucus is mucus and usually when we're talking about fluid in the lungs that's water where that water comes from it's usually the, the plasma that was in our blood so when we have this acute pulmonary edema we will have a decrease ability to have diffusion down between the alveoli and the uh, capillaries there very often we associate this with crackles or rails, fine crackles, coarse crackles, fine rails, coarse rails. That's when we have water that's uh, there down in the alveoli and the bronchioles. Um, we should realize that pulmonary edema could be quiet. All right, they could have pulmonary edema um, and still, and that would be the water is increased in the tissue of the parenchyma yet in between the alveoli and the uh, and the, the capillaries, all right? And then water will always flow through path of least resistance. So it is least resistant to the pressure in the alveoli. And so it'll end up in the alveoli and work its way up into the bronchioles. Now, we should realize that when we hear rails, rails is the movement of air over the the uh, surface of the bronchioles and the and and even bigger airways and then there's water there all right so when there's water there that gives us that bit of crackles it's on the surface of the um, on the surface of the bronchioles all right uh, these then that fluid that water can just completely like drown out alveoli all right no air is going to pass through that all right. Remember that everything gets a little bit bigger on inspiration, so we might be moving it through some of them. But then on expiration with the passive muscles, um, then we probably aren't going to hear anything. All right. Um, so this pulmonary edema can be uh, give you some big, super shortness of breath. And the fluids collect in the alveoli and the lung tissue. And again, a big thing to remember there, that's bronchioles and on your way up from the bronchioles. And so what side of the heart fails and causes pulmonary edema? Hopefully you just boom, jumped on it and that's left. Right-sided heart failure causes peripheral edema and JVD. left side heart failure causes pulmonary edema. And so here's our picture here, and here's a like a kind of a explanation of what I was talking about before, where um, at first that water is going to be in like what we might call the wall of the alveoli, all right, in between the capillary and the alveoli, and then it'll migrate towards the alveoli and give you puddles there, and then it'll just fill up the alveoli as it rushes, as I shouldn't say rush, but as it migrates up the bronchioles. So we will almost always talk about pulmonary edema as a cardiac problem, a left-sided heart problem. There are other causes, all right? Uh, toxic gases can cause it. We'll talk about HAPE maybe for a little while, which is high altitude pulmonary edema. 
long-term hypoxic episodes and shock, uh, chest trauma, those things can also give you pulmonary edema. And usually we're talking about ARDS then, which is adult respiratory distress or acute respiratory distress syndrome, where you're getting, um, again, fluid flowing through the path of least resistance and it comes through into the alveoli. Always, always, always remember that. Good, good, um, you know, physics to remember. Easy stuff. Fluid will always flow through the path of least resistance. Something that we'll talk about uh, minimally now is when we uh, give albuterol and we cause there to be relaxation of the bronchioles every once in a while, that will cause flash pulmonary edema. If the person has a lot of pulmonary hypertension and then uh, some wheezies and we try to fix those wheezies with albuterol, Every once in a while, all of a sudden, boom, the patient will get better and then get much worse. And that's uh, called flash pulmonary edema. So another thing to cause somebody to say I'm short of breath is an anaphylactic reaction. I'm not going to talk about this much right now. We'll talk about anaphylaxis uh, more in a couple of weeks. Um, it, of course, is a severe allergic reaction where your body is releasing a bunch of histamine. And that histamine is going to cause some bronchoconstriction. It's also going to cause some angioedema and then uh, a low blood pressure. So uh, we know that we fight that with some uh, epi. And usually we recognize that as an epi pen. Now we're, getting, we're going to be able to give epi by drawing it up and giving it IM with uh, syringe and needle. So a spontaneous pneumo, uh, pretty easy to figure out here. A spontaneous pneumo is just air uh, is, is leaving the, I like to call it the parenchyma of the lung and going into that potential space. That potential space is located between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. Remember, visceral pleura lines the lung and parietal pleura lines the chest cavity. Um, uh, very often, I've had a few people with these, and they were very stable patients, all right? Um, I, I wouldn't have known that they were spontaneous. Both of mine, uh, I picked up at urgent care centers, and there was a chest x-ray that showed us that they had a spontaneous pneumo. So the way to pick this up is really to figure out the risk factors. So what are the risk factors, do you think, for a spontaneous pneumo? What are the risk factors? So here uh, we see those COPD patients, um, especially the emphysema, they are a risk factor. Anybody who has that hyperinflation of the chest, so it could be that um, asthma patient who's having a hard time today. Um, some people are just born with a bleb, and uh, it seems as though uh, a tall, thin, healthy male um, are at risk for having a spontaneous pneumo. So that basketball player would be important. And then a pleural effusion. We don't need to know much about this. We'll talk about it a little now, a little bit more as a paramedic. But um, I often uh, get this one confused with an emphema. Effusion is just fluid that has made its way into the potential space, the potential space between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. This often, often happens because of something else happened, all right, that the patient may know about. Something has given them an irritation there, so maybe they got a pneumo um, and we're in the hospital for a while and now they've been home for a month, slowly getting more and more shorter breath. That could be a pleural effusion. It could be cancer, it could be an infection, could be a slow growth of something, right? The, the slow infection, the slow growth of cancer, the slow growth of a, a, a benign tumor. Something's irritating that. And this just reminds me of um, friction blisters. All right, so if you have a little bit of friction in there, um, something your body will do is push some fluid there. So, and when we're really talking about a pleural effusion that is so bad that 911 is called, this is a this is gone awry. All right, so we have a big old blister here. Same thing, right? Uh, water is left where it's supposed to be to go into where it's not supposed to be. So this person will very often have just one sided, but it could be both sided. Uh, present a lot like a pneumo. Um, here, we didn't talk about this much in the patient assessment thing, but there's a thing called um, tactile frematis. And tactile frematis is when you're able to feel the vibration 
of the chest when a patient is talking, all right? And here, if you have somebody who has a pneumo, um, they will have an area of their chest that has decreased area because the, uh, the lung tissue will transmit that vibration. Um, where there's air, it won't transmit the vibration. So with your open hands, having them over the whole back of the patient, you might be able to pick up a change in the, the uh, tactile fremitus on one side versus the other. With a pleural effusion, since this is water and water transmits that vibration, uh, you may feel even more vibration where the pleural effusion is. Really, really difficult to pick up unless you're checking tactile fremitus a lot. And that's what your patients are for, checking tactile fremitus. Um, just a little bit about uh, pleural emphema. Um, that's E-M-P-H-Y-M-A. That's when there's pus there. So now it's, uh, I would like to call it a little bit more infectious. That's usually going to be a fever and things of that sort also. The patient's going to have an inflammatory reaction to that. And pulmonary emboli is next. And so pulmonary emboli, um, we've had a few of these. And the pulmonary emboli is a little bit uh, difficult to talk about because this really could be just uh, somebody saying, oh, I have a little bit of chest pain. Oh, it's causing me to be a little shorter breath. Um, and never do anything about it and, and, and then be okay, all right? And the body will take care of the emboli. It'll be a small emboli. The other one is the person has a grabber and dies and then stays purple uh, pretty much the rest of his life, which is short term. Um, so th that would be a saddle emboli, I guess. So an emboli that is a bigger emboli, of course, is going to present with a bigger, bigger problem. The way to pick this up is, remember, the clot is in the vessel, all right? It's in an artery, and that would be the pulmonary artery that's pushing venous blood towards the lungs. The emboli is something that moves. Um, when we talk about pulmonary emboli, the way we pick it up, because the lung sounds will be clear, all right? The lung sounds should be clear. Um, there's no reason for them to have something um, like rails or wheezes. Uh, not saying they can't have them, but they sh there's no like pathology-wise reason for them to have um, those adventitious lung sounds with just a pulmonary emboli. So the way we pick them up is uh, history, all right? Uh, it's usually going to be then, as we're students, we like to hopefully get somewhat of a textbook case and it'll be the sudden onset of shortness of breath and chest pain together. It is a pleuritic chest pain that worsens with inspiration and things. And then we're going to get it by checking the risk factors. All right. So talking to them again about recent surgery, maybe broken bones, history of sickle cell anemia, being bedridden or uh, stuck in a wheelchair, all of those things, oral contraceptives for the female patient. All of those are good risk factors, and that's how you're going to be able to kind of figure out that it's a, a, I would say, a probable pulmonary embolism. So they would have that acute onset of everything. They don't have to have hemoptysis. They don't have to have synopsinosis. Um, it's going to be varying degrees of hypoxia, and it could be minimal. All right, could be minimal. And then the hyperventilation patient, um, one of the big things to remember here, we talked about it a little bit as far as respiratory, it gives you respiratory alkalosis. Um, hyperventilation is something that we will first have to rule everything else out. So you really should be using um, pulse oximetry and capnography before you're jumping on the bandwagon of hyperventilation. Hopefully, you'll start to see that there is a good reason for the anxiety, that maybe there is a history of anxiety. And then they start to pop with things like um, tingling in their hands and feet or maybe carpal pedal spasms. And that is it for respiratory emergencies. Um, we didn't really cover pneumonia, which is pretty easy, right? Pneumonia, the patient will have flu-like symptoms for a day or so, a fever, productive cough of a purulent sputum of some sort. Usually that's going to be yellow or green. Sometimes we'll throw in a rust-colored sputum. 
And then when you listen to lung sounds, there'll be a coarse, coarse rails or a ronchi there, usually in one area. You usually have pneumonia or a pulmonary infection just in one area, one lobe, and that would be it. The norm is for those to be in the lower lobes simply because we have maybe from different positional things, we have lower movement of air there, so it allows for the infection to, uh, to uh, take hold. And then what we do for those patients as advanced EMTs is um, we're probably just going to uh, put them on oxygen and start an IV. We might want to give them fluid if they have signs of dehydration. Um, if we hear wheezes, we could think about giving them albuterol. Um, and CPAP is, is on the table for discussion. So if we think that they really, um, you know, they have low pulse oximetry and we think we can maybe open up some of those smaller airways, CPAP could be thought about. Um, CPAP has some danger because we'll be pushing air past obstructions and that could lead to a hyperinflated chest. I hope you enjoyed the lecture um, and uh, leave any questions in the comments. Um, and I'm not sure how often I'll get to uh, read those, but I would love to uh, answer questions via comments and uh, have a great day. Thanks.